So this will be the last lecture on Bitcoin itself uh, before we start looking at more general uh, improvements of Bitcoin leading to other blockchain solutions like Ethereum. Uh, but there were a few issues that I just um, I missed uh, going through. And so this is sort of going to be a few quick uh, issues or things that we didn't talk about that um, that uh, add up to uh, just sort of a, a lecture of miscellaneous things. Um, so let's just to kick ourselves off. Uh, let's start about uh, start thinking about uh, a blockchain uh, where we have say these three blocks that have been created, and uh, what all the miners are trying to do is they're trying to create an extension uh, to this particular block, and specifically what they're doing is they're uh, pointing a previous block at the previous block. Uh, they have their transactions that they bundled together. Uh, so that's in the Merkle root, and they're running their knots like a counter, for example. Uh, and what they're looking for is that there'll be a current target uh, that's defined. And what they're hoping to do is find a value here that's smaller than the target. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to apologize for in the, in the past videos, uh, I wrote, even though I said in words it, uh, I said it correctly in words, I, I wrote it uh, incorrectly. I, I inverted the sign. And so... Uh, what we want is we want the target uh, to be bigger than this value, not this value bigger than the target. So this is the correct notation. Um, there's no easy way to go back and fix it. So anyways, that's that's that. Okay, so this is what all the miners are doing. Um, all of them will have a slightly different... Um, so, so this is all miners. Let me do it in a different color. They're going to have a different Merkle root uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the most, uh, even if everything else is considered uh, equal, like they choose the exact same transactions in the exact same order, which is highly unlikely, but possible. Um, the Coinbase transaction, though, at least be, uh, will be specified to their own addresses. And so different miners with different addresses or at least different collections of miners if they're in a pool or something like that. Uh, all the miners within a pool will be solving the exact same proof of work, but uh, for individual miners with their own keys, they're all going to have a different Coinbase transaction. Uh, when you hash that into the Merkle root, it's going to result in a completely different Merkle root. Uh, therefore, the result will be that everyone's going to be uh, mining on a different value here. Okay. Uh, another thing that gets uh, sometimes tr trips people up, um, I'll just mention it here, is let's say that, um, that uh, let's actually back this up. Let's say that when this block was created, uh, very quickly after, or maybe simultaneously, and depending on where you were in the network, it, it was sort of a, a coin toss, which you would hear about, uh, there was another block that was created as well. Okay. And so half of the network is here. They're trying to, to solve a block that extends this. In other words, the previous block is pointing at this block. And the other half of the network uh, is up here. And they're trying to extend this other block. So we'll say 50% of the network here and 50% here. OK. Now what will happen is um, one of these two will win, usually. Maybe maybe this repeats itself a couple times. Uh, so both of these find blocks at largely the same time. And uh, since they were, they all heard about this block, you know, everyone in this 50% heard about this block first, then there's something about this 50% they're better connected to each other. And so they might all hear about this block first as well. Um, and similarly uh, with this block here. So maybe this, this, uh, this sort of pattern uh, this pattern, by the way, is called a fork. Uh, so maybe this fork does continue, but what we see is that it dies off very, very quickly. Okay, so it's uh, the probability that it extends past a couple blocks uh, is, is very, very low. Uh, and usually what happens is it gets resolved. Um, so the mechanics of how it would get resolved is, let's say, uh, for example, this person wins. Um, so they now have the longest chain. So obviously everyone who is working here will now be uh, working on extending this block. Okay, And all the people down here that were working here, as soon as they hear about this block, then they know that the chain that goes to the up 
part of this diagram is longer than the chain on the bottom. It's longer by one block. And so they'll all switch as well. So they'll all go up here. Uh, this 50% will stay here. Um, and so what will end up happening is you'll get 100% of the network uh, that's trying to extend this block. Okay. Uh, what happens to this block? This block gets um, orphaned. Uh, sometimes this, this whole process is called a reorganization, especially if there's sort of a chain of a couple blocks that get orphaned, uh, then we might call it a reorg uh, of, of the chain. Um, but, but anyways, basically everyone will switch here and then, and then we'll continue, okay? So it is possible that we have these kind of temporary forks, uh, but generally forks resolve themselves uh, quite quickly. So the rule of thumb is uh, that, uh, so in general, Forks resolve themselves within six blocks. Usually it's a lot less than six blocks. Uh, what we've seen uh, in the past empirically, you can look at the blockchain and see. Uh, you can't see it in the blockchain because once they're orphaned, they're forgotten. But there, there are people who keep records of um, things that, that were proposed that, that weren't included in the final blockchain. Um, and so what will happen is, uh, um, what, what you can see is that, that six blocks is a very generous amount of time. Um, there have been a couple cases of things that have lost, lasted longer than six blocks, uh, but it wasn't because people were solving blocks simultaneously. It was because there was some other issue, some other technical issue that was causing a fork. Uh, for example, the, there were miners who had incompatible software, for example, and so uh, they, they were not seeing, it was, they were seeing each other's blocks, but they were thinking that they were invalid. Half of them thought that they were valid because they had updated and half of them didn't. Um, so anyways, that, that's a very interesting story uh, that happened once. Uh, but anyways, it's not a story for today. Um, what else will I say? Uh, the other thing is that uh, because of this, as a consequence of this, what we do is we generally say that a transaction is f confirmed Uh, after six blocks has been added onto the end. Okay, so uh, in, in the number of blocks that have been added is usually called the number of confirmations. So uh, if we have a transaction and we're sitting here, um, first off, the transaction starts just, it's in the UTXO pool. Okay, so uh, at this point in time, before this block is created, uh, this transaction, we say it's zero, has zero confirmations or zero conf is this standard. Uh, then when we're sort of here, uh, we say it has one confirmation, uh, which means it's been put in a block. Uh, and then if we're here, uh, then it has two confirmations. And eventually we'll reach six confirmations. Um, and then we'll say that that transaction is very unlikely uh, to get orphaned because of some sort of reorganization. Okay. Uh, so a transaction is confirmed after six blocks. And this is a heuristic, it's just by consideration and looking empirically, and it's just sort of a rule that, that, that people tend to follow. Um, now, does that mean that you're gonna wait six blocks in order if you buy coffee? Are you gonna wait, remember six blocks is 60 minutes. It's worth noting as well on average. So this is actually quite a while uh, for, for a transaction to be confirmed. Um, are you gonna wait 60 minutes for your coffee? No, probably not. Uh, but what's happening there is that the coffee shop is taking a risk uh, they're going to see that it's on the pool and yes, it's true. You could, you know, this transaction could go away. And by the way, there, there are ways, uh, we, we mentioned the double spending attack sort of comes back in a different form in Bitcoin where you purposely try and get different transactions that spend the same Bitcoin in different forks and hoping that, that uh, your transaction gets removed or you, you put it out on the network. You put two transactions out on the network and you hope that one of them gets included in the block and the other one doesn't. Um, in all of these cases, uh, the, the coffee shop is basically taking a risk and I mean, it's very simple for the coffee shop. They think that, that this is a technically sophisticated attack and there's probably easier ways for you to steal a cup of coffee than that. And if enough people stole coffee, coffee this way, then I'm sure they would stop accepting Bitcoin. Uh, if it's a large value Bitcoin transaction, like say you're moving money onto an exchange, uh, then 
the exchange service will wait uh, six blocks before they, they give you access uh, to those funds. Okay, now the, the final thing is what happens to this block? Okay, so there's all of this stuff in the block. We say it's orphan. What, what, what does that mean? Well, the, what that means is that when this block goes away, whoever solved it, uh, there, the Coinbase was one of the transactions that was in this block that's going to be different than one of the transactions that are in this block. So these two blocks don't necessarily have the same set of transactions. And one transaction that's guaranteed to be different is that Coinbase transaction. And so that Coinbase tr transaction is gone. Okay, so even though you, this person who mined this block, even though they solved it, they put their Coinbase transaction in, unless if their block gets incorporated in the longest chain, they don't really have that money. Okay, so uh, even when you're mining and you solve a block, it's not like you, you're guaranteed that you actually solve that block and you're going to get rewarded for it. Okay, you have to wait until the network extends your block uh, and, and same rule applies, you would generally wait six before you would say, okay, that, that's really my block. Um, now, different blockchains will change this rule. So in Ethereum, uh, if people within a certain window of time come up with alternative uh, blocks, it's called an uncle block, uh, this block relative to this. And, and there's ways for them to get paid later on, um, later on in the process. Uh, so, so actually, the uncle is is relative to to this block here, but uh, basically, they they could get a small fraction of it uh, of the block reward. Uh, but anyways, that's that's uh, something that that Ethereum does that Bitcoin doesn't do. And Bitcoin is very unforgiving. Uh, if if you aren't part of the longest chain, then your money's gone. Uh, the other thing I I would mine or add. Uh, so when you mine the block, uh, so you're going to get. Uh, we talked about this before, you'll get the block reward and you'll get fees. And we said that the fees are the difference between the sum of, um, uh, the inputs minus the outputs. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about that I was, was should have talked about is who sets the fees? Who decides? We have a mechanism, but how do you decide that, that your inputs are going to be less uh, or greater than your outputs and by how much, right? Uh, how much is the fee? And so the answer is it's decided by the market. So you can think of it as kind of like an auction where a bunch of people submit transactions and you're free to put any fee that you want in. You can even put zero fees if you want. And the miners are free to, to take transactions or ignore them. And so you basically put a fee in such that a miner will accept it. And there's no rule or algorithm that you can write down uh, that's going to tell you how much that fee should be. It's based on a free market or a floating. So the, the rate is a, a free floating rate. Um, so it floats based on market conditions. And uh, the more competition there is, uh, so if there's a lot of transactions, say there's more transactions than could actually fit in a specific block, uh, then you would expect fees to go up because you're kind of auctioning off a scarce resource, a scarce, res scarce resource is room in this block. And Bitcoin in particular has very small blocks. Uh, they've been criticized uh, for having blocks that are, are really small, um, so small that they, they don't allow what you would expect from an electronic transfer system. So if you think about uh, the average size of a block, uh, if you think about the average size of a transaction, and you think of a transaction, or sorry, blocks coming once every 10 minutes, um, you know, based, this is based on a few heuristics, but you arrive at a number that's roughly uh, seven transactions in a second. That's sort of the throughput. Of course, they're not coming every second. It's every 10 minutes, there's a huge chunk of transactions. Um, but anyways, if you think in terms of averages, uh, you get a thousand transactions per second. And that's really slow in financial terms. So, you know, the Visa network or something like that could, could do a lot more. They could do maybe a thousand transactions a second or, or even more than that. Um, so uh, anyways, the, the point is that, that blocks being full or close to full has now that Bitcoin has become more popular at the time I'm making this lecture anyways, um, the block size is, is still stuck at one megabyte. It, it's a little bigger uh, due to some complicated cryptography. Um, 
but but anyways, it's around one megabyte. And uh, anyways, it, it you know it, it often fills up or it gets close to capacity, and so uh, fees go up as a result of it. Um, so when there's low supply, uh, the cost of something goes up, and so this what's in low supply here is room in blocks. Uh, and so as you can imagine, the fees go up, okay? And from a miner's perspective, what's, what's their goal? Uh, so their goal is, well, they want to accept enough fees uh, so that they uh, make money uh, because they have costs. It, mining's not free, right? You might think, well, I'm going to run my computer. Maybe I, I'm going to run my computer overnight. I'm not using it anyway, so that's essentially free. But you forget that that's drawing hydro, right? And you're paying for that hydro. Your hydro bill is going to go up if you run your computer mining Bitcoin overnight. Um, so as a result, um, the fee is going to have some relationship to hydro costs. The final thing I'll mention is that mining uh, has been scaled up. So it's no longer something you do on your computer. We talked a bit about the different technologies and the different uh, considerations uh, that go into it. But uh, mining is, um, you know, when we think of miners, we think of like data centers that are full of, of ASICs and, and things like that. Um, Uh, so mining sort of at the data center scale. Uh, and so anyways, when you scale things up, what it means is that uh, there's a little less variance. Uh, and, you know, when you're operating at scale, you're also going to consider uh, hydro costs. Uh, and you can do things financially to, to insulate yourself from fluctuations in hydro costs. Uh, so you can negotiate you know energy futures and and there's a few like financial products that you can use that will act as an insurance against large um, changes and this is something you would never ever do if you were just mining on your own computer at home but when you have these large operations uh, what you can do is you can also um, try and smooth out uh, some of the risk uh, that's associated uh, with mining as well